Naive CDA T cells require stronger activation signals than that would we would see with the naive CD4 T cells. And um, obviously this is kind of important based on just the identity and the action of what CD8 positive T cells are doing. But the way that we mainly do this is the fact that we need a larger amounts, I'm going to delete that because that looks gross, larger amounts, more interleukin-2 is going to be required. Now, sometimes that excessive amount of interleukin-2 is sufficient when it comes from the CD8 T cell. But most of the time, we need a CD4 helper T cell to give us the necessary levels of interleukin-2 to result in the activation of our CD8 T cells. So they're activated, what is their job that they're going to do? Well, obviously we know what cytotoxins do. We've talked about their name, and, and I think at the very beginning of this course, whenever I gave a generalized overview of the immune system, I told you what CD8 T cells do. And they use this by cytotoxins, but what I didn't know prior to this was that they all also produce cytokines that all are going to act locally at a short distance. They can be autocrine or paracrine. And all effector T cells, including natural killer cells as well, produce cytokines, but they do it of different types and they do it of different concentrations. Relaxing the activation requirements um, allows the cytotoxic T cells to be able to kill infected cells that do not express B7. All right, that's really important. Especially because uh, when we talked about later with the, like the whole B7 interaction and the importance of that for naive T cell activation, and now we're going into the fact that we have to be able to kill virtually any cell in your body that becomes infected with the virus or becomes infected with a specific type of cancer that is compatible with the CD8 T cell receptor. And this is just a diagram showing it, how it works. Notice that it works one cell at a time, but they are extremely and extremely proficient at doing this. And in some contexts, they're so efficient at this, it can actually like strip away your entire epithelia if it gets infected with say like a, a respiratory virus and then leave kind of your body almost prone to secondary infections as well. So it's, it really is something that must be tightly regulated and tightly controlled. And so um, this diagram here is just talking about the specifics of the mechanism for it. So once the pathogens um, get inside the cell, um, they start infected it, it's going to be presenting itself, it's, you know, those MHC class one molecules there. And the primary function of a cytotoxic T cell is to destroy virally infected cells. And after migrating to the site of infection, they're specifically attached to the infected T cells by T cell receptors, leaving the healthy cells alone. I also want to make note of the understanding that this is unlike the natural killer cells. So like, you know, natural killer cells have cytotoxins. Natural killer cells have other types of receptors. But unlike them, the cytotoxic T cell requires one signal. And that's through their, their own T cell receptors and the co-receptor. That interaction alone is required for the T cell, the cytotoxic T cell to decide whether or not a host cell needs to die or not. And that's incredibly crazy to me. <laughs> Unlike the natural killer cell, which was so, you know, is so much like he sits there and he listens to the verdict and this guy just makes up his mind right away. Anyways, granules are going to be secreted in a polar fashion, and what I mean by saying a polar fashion, a clear, direct sequence, and that's what I love about this picture. So here we see um, the interactions of what I think looks like some integrins and cell adhesion molecules, and then the migration of, and here's the, in this context, is the Golgi apparatus, the microtubule organizing center, we're just, it's almost like we're getting into close proximity to drop this entire payload of lytic granules. This is going to result in apoptosis, and there's a picture uh, of the, the, the exchange happening between the two there. And in red, I think that's the lytic granules, but don't quote me on that. Rather than doing like lysis, uh, apoptosis is gonna keep infectious virons from being released since, uh, uh, released since the cell condenses, right? And so here we see a healthy cell, a necrotic cell, and then an apoptotic cell. And this late apoptotic cell here, and, and what's happening here is, one, the cell, the membrane is being kind of eroded away, the cell is kind of dissolving, but the nucleus is being highly condensed and, and, and it leaves this nice little tidy corpse that we can very quickly clean up without releasing any other infectious particles inside of it. And so they induce apoptosis by two specific mechanisms. The two mechanisms that they have is cytotoxins are gonna be released, uh, specifically perforin and granzymes. And I'm gonna make a map where I specifically at the end of this video if I have time or if I'll attach a link to it where I talk about the details of that mechanisms. But all you need to know is that perforin just opens up a hole in the cell membrane and then that allows all the granzymes to come in and then basically digest the cell from the inside out. And then the uh, another thing though that also works, it's not just through the use of the granzymes, but we also are going to induce signals that are going to cause the suicide genes apoptotic genes to be turned on. This is done by the FAS ligand binding to the FAS receptor on the infected cell. 
So cytotoxic T cells are also going to be releasing interferon gamma, which assists in the activation of macrophages, which is what we would want to have to come and clean up that nice, tidy little corpse that we just made. So we have the cytotoxic T cell. I'm going to talk about how they're activated, and then lastly, their effector mechanisms. For activation, we've already kind of mentioned this to some extent, but we uh, have a lot of interleukin-2, and our decision whether or not we're going to kill another human cell is based off of one signal. The decision to go from a naive to a cytotoxic T cell cell, CD8 T cell, predominantly revolves around interleukin-2, and we need, in this context, a lot of it, usually with the help of a CD4 T cell. And for these guys, the decision of whether or not they're going to kill one of your own cells or not to kill one of your own cells is based off of one single signal. Review, if you'd like, <laughs> the natural killer cell mechanisms, and then you'll understand why I'm so impressed by that. So for effector mechanisms, there's three ones that I wanted to mention. There's cytotoxins, cytokines, and then lastly, just the fast ligand. The cytotoxins, we have ones that are involved in actually opening up the membrane, and then openly, they're only opening up the membrane so that the uh, ones that are involved in inducing apoptosis can come in. One of the ones that are involved in tearing a hole into the target cell membranes, this consists of perforin and then granulysin. One of the things I also wanted to note is that as you have between kind of connecting these two, or really just assisting with their delivery is a scaffold protein by the name of serglycin, which that has other functions outside of this. But anyways, for the apoptotic um, cytotoxins, those are mostly just known as granzymes. There's really two targets for uh, granzymes. One of this is BID, and the other one would be the procapsase 3. For BID, it's going to ultimately re result in have a lytic action, which is only going to result in splitting it in two, and then one half of that, of the BID molecule, is going to go on to the mitochondria and then ultimately result in cytochrome C being released. So that's obvious. I'm just going to say it like three times, all right? So one of the actions that granzymes have is to cleave the protein BID into two, and then one fragment of that is going to go to the mitochondria and result in the release of cytochrome C. Now, I don't know how much biology you've taken or how much understanding that you have this, but know that cytochrome C is an electron transport chain protein. So even if, say, the procapsase 3 fails and we still have viruses inside of our cell, or say this is a cancer cell, that's not going to have any ATP to be able to, to do its work. So it's, it's basically going to fail that way. But it would also have a fail-safe mechanism in that we have procapsase 3 as well. So what this does is it's going to have a conformational change, which is going to result in the activation of procapsase 3. Procapsase 3 is going to, once it's activated, it's going to cleave something known as ICAD. And I don't really think I left a whole lot of room for it, but the most important thing is that you understand that we're going to be activating our DNA ases. So enzymes that are designed to degrade and destroy and cut up our own DNA. For the fast L, the fast ligand, this is something that is located on the cytotoxic T cell, right? And what it does is it's going to ultimately bind to its receptor, which I'll just draw it out like this. Uh, the FAS is the name of the identity of the receptor itself, and this interaction here is going to result in a signal transduction pathway. The signal transduction pathway is going to result in the activation and turning on of apoptotic genes, suicide genes, right? So for the cytokines that the cytotoxic T cell makes, this consists of really just two kinds, and this is kind of a secondary function of theirs. Interleukin-2, which, yeah, I think we've already talked about the role that that plays, but um, interferon gamma, which plays a role in a lot of things, but in this context, Text, really just attracting macrophages to come in and clean up this this so because the action of this with this apoptotic mechanism is so that all this stuff really just kind of comes to play so that we have a very clean corpse and that we don't have any release of infectious virus particles or infectious virons. So I'm just gonna say that it keeps the tissue clean. One last thing that I wanted to mention is that cytotoxins are made, and I don't have room to write it, so I'm just going to say it, uh, that cytotoxins are made in the inactive form, and then upon activation, usually inside of some type of a lysosome or lytic granule, that's whenever they start to be able to do their things. But cytokines, as really more so with the helper T cells, but also with CD8 T cells, those are made and produced on contact.